So I mentioned earlier that we begin a new series this week, and it'll be going through the end of October. And it's really an invitation to this whole idea of faith walking, which is a journey of transformation. It's saying we talk a lot about faith. We may have some knowledge of faith, but it's a harder journey to see that knowledge lived into practice that reflects transformation. Now, there's something that the church does. It's called the lectionary. And you may go to a number of other churches on this Sunday and find that they are reading texts that are similar to the ones that we're reading. And the lectionary takes us through a journey of parables in Matthew. Really tough parables. And I was trying to think, I have to go back through my database and see how many times I've preached on these parables through Matthew 18. Because they, they come as parables of grace, but also parables of judgment at the end of Jesus' ministry. So putting together those parables of grace and judgment, where Jesus, I think, is asking the basic question of all of us. It says, it would be nice if the redeemed look more redeemed. You ever thought that? Wouldn't that be nice? And I know that when I do that, <clears throat> I usually have two or three people that I think of that I start pointing my finger at. And I start saying, well, they say they're redeemed. It'd be nice if they looked more redeemed. You have two or three people you're thinking of right now? All right? I want you to take that out of your head and I want you to think of one person. <laughs> Who do you think that is? Yeah, let's start there, okay? It's easy to go out there. Let's start here. And listen as Jesus speaks to us in Matthew 18. And it's one of the few times that the word church is mentioned in the New Testament. Interesting. Jesus has just talked about conflict in the church and Peter doesn't really seem to get it. And uh, so Jesus, uh, uh, so Peter is talking about forgiven seven times, which if you know anything about biblical numbers, seven is like a perfect number. So Peter's like being Saint Peter here and saying, like, should I forgive up to like seven times? And Jesus blows him out of the water. And some translations say 70 times seven. Our translation, the New Revised Standard, says 77. But Jesus is saying, you can't even imagine Peter, the number we're talking about. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slave. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10 thousand talents was brought to him. Ten thousand talents, just for your information, would be translated like ten million dollars. Okay, Jesus was using a, a, a figure that was like way out there, unreachable for, for any person in that society to, to even comprehend. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience. That word actually translates mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But the same slave as he went out came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii was like the payment for a day wage. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe me. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him. These are the exact same words the slave used with the master. Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have met, had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So today we talk about faith walking. We're really talking about transformation. St. Arrhenius said this. He said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And we believe that the fully alive life is the one that Jesus models. It's a missional life and is one that each of us is called to live. Okay? Each of us is called to live a missional life. It's what we talk about when we talk about 167 living. And we're changing the arcs of transformation a little bit. If you've seen that logo before, you know it's discipleship, worship, and mission. We said those are the three, the three arcs of transformation. As people get involved in worship, as people get involved in discipleship, small groups, accountability, structure like that, as people get involved in mission, they start to know what it means to be transformed and live the life that God has called them to. We're talking... Little different words tied together with that. We're talking about radical obedience. That leads to a missional life. We're talking about a reflective life where our word increasingly co-creates the world with God. And then finally, an authentic community that is mobilized around a shared mission. Okay, that's just an introduction today to that. Stay with me. Hold on. We'll get to more of that. But it's so great because today we have Tina Smith from South Africa with us here. Come on up, Tina. And Tina, uh, I've asked her to share testimony about her life, and I've asked her to share some of what's going on with J-Life in South Africa. But it's great because we're talking about transformation, and Tina's journey has been a joy to watch because it was, what, about 2005? You came to this church, not as a Christian. Right. 2012, you left this church on mission to South Africa. Yes. Is that transformation or what? I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about. And, and don't hear what I'm not saying. That's what Mark always says, right? Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying to live a missional life, you've got to up, sell all your stuff, and move to South Africa. But transformation is reflected in the way we live, and the way we love, and the way we live God's call in our life. And that can happen right where you are. That's the first thing I want you to understand. Nod your head and say, we got that, Taylor. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, everybody here is going to be working for J-Life in South Africa in a couple <laughs> years. The second thing, I, I don't want to uh, bring up St. Tina here today and say she's arrived... <laughs> And is perfect in every way and we're holding her up, putting her up on a pedestal. Because Tina, we'll tell you, that she struggles. The journey's still tough in many ways. But what I want you to hear is a testimony of transformation. And I want it to be a testimony that we all share in some way as we live into the calling that God gives us. So will you welcome Tina Smith. Good morning. It's really nice to see so many people that I know. But it's a bigger blessing to see so many people that I don't know. And um, when I come home, I get emotional. Because there's things that I want to share with you. And there's things that I want to say to you that come from my heart. So this morning I prepared. And I thought I knew what I was going to say. And then something always happens. The Holy Spirit starts speaking to me in the pew. <laughs> and I say, no, 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 I'm not talking to you today. But <laughs> he, he talks louder than, than I want to, um, yeah, admit to. So this morning, Taylor um, read a passage about forgiveness. And I want to start my story there. Because um, I actually came to Hopewell in 2004. But in 2003... My sister told me about the forgiving heart of Jesus. And um, we weren't raised in a church or we weren't raised in a family that even spoke about God. And as a young person and as a young um, adult, I had made some really bad choices. So my sister tried to tell me about Jesus and I tried to tell her that she didn't know the things that I had done. And Several years back in this congregation, I shared my whole testimony, and it's a testimony of promiscuity, 
an abortion, and just some really bad choices. But she told me about Jesus and that he died on the cross for me. And in J Life, we identify kind of the life and ministry of Jesus and how gentle he is with us. And for me, the first thing that we talk about is Jesus' invitation to come and see. Jesus doesn't say, you're a sinner and I condemn you. He doesn't say that to any of us. He gently invites us to come and see. Come and see who I'm about. My sister's conversation that day was a gentle, come and see who this Jesus person is. And it wasn't too long after that, maybe another year goes by, and I'm in my room, I can't tell you the day or the month or any of that, but I asked Jesus, if you're real, can you forgive me? And that day, something lifted from me that I didn't even know I was really holding on to, and that was guilt and shame and remorse. And Jesus said, yes, I'm real, and I can forgive you, Tina. So then I start coming to church, <clears throat> and that's the second part of Jesus' thing, is he doesn't want me just to believe. Jesus wants me to change. He asks me to repent, and I do. So I say, I don't want to be that old person. I want to be somebody new in Jesus' love and grace. So that's the second part of Jesus' call. He asks us to come and see. Then he says, can you believe? Then he asks us to repent and be somebody transformed, somebody new. And I did. <clears throat> then we get here and we end up going on a few short-term mission trips, probably several actually. But one of them was to South Africa. And then John asked us at one point a few years later if we would consider coming and serving with them full time. Jesus asked us again, come and follow me. Every step of the way, Jesus is giving us an invitation to be different, to change, to believe. He said, come, Tina, follow me. So I did. And he took me to South Africa. Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't want me just to follow him. He asks me now, he says, Tina, now you need to go and make disciples in all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. He's not content with me just believing and just sucking in and absorbing everything that he has to give me. He wants me to share it. I saw that beautiful picture this morning of these teachers lined up here with these children. They're making disciples. They're telling somebody and pouring into those children the love and grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And they're actually making disciples. That's what God calls us to. He gives us a great commandment. We all know what the great commandment is. Love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your heart. And then he says, what we say is the great commission. And I just said it. Go for, therefore into all the nations, making disciples. God calls us to be disciple makers. We get discipleship in church. But he calls us to be disciple makers. And Taylor's right, you don't need to be in South Africa to do that. You don't have to be at church to do that. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher to do that. Nelson can do that at his work. He works outside the church. Nelson can do that at his work. He can be different. The church should look different, guys. I should look different. When people see me out and about, I should look different. Jesus gave me a gift of forgiveness. I should also speak into that forgiveness. I have to have a forgiving heart. I have to have a loving heart. I have to have a merciful heart. I have to have a humble heart. It does break my heart that sometimes I'm not that person. I think that song, you know, in all I do, I honor you. Sometimes I don't honor him in all I do. I want to, and I don't always, always get it right. Taylor's right. None of us should be on a pedestal. Taylor certainly does not deserve to be on a pedestal. I don't deserve to be on a pedestal, and nobody here does. The only one that deserves to be on a pedestal is Jesus Christ. Um, but I have a beautiful story of transformation. I had never known that I could be forgiven and be freed of, of what this world had told me who I was. 
And I had a sister that was willing to share that with me. I'm going to just give you guys, as Taylor says, a challenge or an invitation that you share what Jesus has done in your life for you. Share it with somebody that has never heard it. Tell them how he loves you and how he has freed you. That's what we're called to do. We're called to do it whether we're sitting here in Hopewell or we're, whether we're sitting in South Africa. J-Life is an organization that a lot of you know about. Warren and Lynette came out of J-Life, so you know the heart of, of J-Life. They, they are examples of it. Um, I have the honor to serve with them on the international team. Um, we've been there for two years. We're trying to get back there. Our visas have not been extended yet, so we're leaving tomorrow in faith <laughs> that we'll be able to get to South Africa and have some other paperwork um, completed. Um, if God says time's up, then we'll be back in December because we'll only be able to be there for 90 days. Many missionaries do this. The Lotus family, you, you've probably heard, I mean, they used to have to hop in and out of Malaysia just to stay there, but they were willing to do the hard work. Um, I'm asking you guys to pray for the missionaries that this church supports. Pray for Rachel in all earnest. Pray for her that she makes good decisions while she's in the DR. Pray for her that her communities are changed because of the love that she has and the way that she's ministering to them. Pray for the low, um, uh, sorry, Kevin and, sorry. Robin. Robin, thank you. Pray for Kevin and Robin. Pray for Skipper and I. We have spent two years in South Africa and for one and a half of those, we have been separated. Some of you know that and some of you don't. But God has redeemed that. God has reconciled that, that, and so we move back in together in June. I want to be upfront and honest with you guys. Life sometimes is tough as a Christian, but we have hope in Jesus, and I think that that's something that you guys just need to know and you need to hang on to. And I really, really pray that as a church that you will pray as hard and as sincere for this church as you did for Andrew. I pray that you have so much compassion and love for one another that you'll be on your knees, that you'll be asking after the health of the church, that you'll be asking after the health and of your pastors as much as you asked after the health of Andrew after his accident. That was a blessing for me to be in South Africa and read those prayers. And those prayers went out all over Africa, and it was a blessing to all the country leaders. So we were really thankful that we were able to participate in that. But prayer is our way to communicate with one another. When you guys pray for me, I know that I've been prayed for. And I just want to thank you guys for really just being such a loving congregation and for letting me come and speak today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. And that's really a picture of we're what we're talking about. Not perfection, not that she has found the perfect place to serve for all of us, but transformation. That God is calling us to reflect his grace in the way that we live. And it, it, it's really a plea right now. It's really a plea for the church to be a place that is different. Uh, because you know, and I know, that a lot of times the church is a place where it's not different. And I think Jesus, as he's starting to shape that vision of a church here at the end of his ministry in Matthew, is, is starting to say there needs to be some consistency between the grace that you've received and the grace that you give to others. So in this parable, just putting that template of the gospel that we talked about last time, the the goodness of God is the beginning of the story. The guilt that we have fallen short of the glory of God. The grace that is God's answer to that problem. And the gratitude that's affected, reflected in the way that we live. The goodness of God in this parable is, is seen in a God who has given this servant $10 million dollars. You know, a trust. If you, if you start right there, you realize that this is a good servant that is trusted 
by the master. You don't get $10 million unless there's a sense that you're able to live into the calling that's given to you in that. I mean, grace starts with God's goodness, doesn't it? Paul in Corinthians says, what do you have that's not a gift? You're breathing. You're walking. The sun is shining. There is so much around us each and every moment that reflects God's amazing goodness that's before us, that's given to us as that $10 million trust that you're invited to use, to use, to restore this creation that's broken. And we know the guilt, and Tina shared a touch of her story. But you just look around the world and you recognize the divisions and the hatred and the enmity that's, that's there and, and the lack of forgiveness that we have and the slave is called before the king and the debt is unpayable. There's no way that this, this servant can pay this debt. But how clueless is the servant when he says, just give me a little more time. Have some mercy on me. Still a self-salvation plan for this servant, right? I'm going to do it my way. He's not even listening to the king the king who says, your debt's been paid. You're forgiven. It's over. Clean slate. And yet the servant walks out, the slave walks out, not being touched and amazed by that grace, but still living with an image of a God, king if you will, that keeps records and scores and keeping score against him. And so this time, he's even more aggressive and grabs the other slave by the throat and says, pay what you owe me. Right there, right there, I want us all to look into our hearts in those places where we don't truly recognize the grace that God has shown to us and therefore don't show that grace to others. But then my favorite part of the parable is here. There's people around the slave that know the story and say, wait a second, wait a second. Didn't your king forgive you this great debt? And don't you know the grace of the king that, that set you free? And, and this is something I see a lot. That people outside of the church, a lot of say, wait a second, you Christians are supposed to be the grace givers, right? Not the judgers. What's your favorite line from Gandhi, Kevin? I love your Christ, just not your Christians. Just not your Christians. Somebody asked Gandhi why he wasn't a Christian. He said, I love Jesus. And he said, I do not like your Christians. And he said, your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And so these other slaves say, whoa, wait a second. What's going on here, King? This guy that you've shown grace to is now pouring out judgment against another. And then this parable of grace, Robert Capone is one of the guys I'm reading on these parables, a great writer if you want to read this. And uh, he says this, at this point this parable of grace turns to a parable of judgment, doesn't it? You know, where Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you miss the whole point. Capone says this, he says, in heaven, there are only forgiven sinners. There are no good guys, no upright successful types, who by the dint of their own integrity have been accepted into the great country club in the sky. There are only failures, only those who have accepted their deaths and their sins and who have been raised up by the king who himself died that they might live. But in hell too, there are only forgiven sinners. Jesus on the cross does not sort out certain exceptionally recalcitrant parties and cut them off from the pardon of his death. He forgives the badness of even the worst of us. Willy-nilly and never takes back that forgiveness, not even at the bottom of the bottomless pit. The sole difference, therefore, 
between hell and heaven is that in heaven forgiveness is accepted and passed along while in hell it is rejected and blocked. In heaven the death of the king is welcomed and becomes the doorway to new life in the resurrection. In hell the old life of, bookkeeping, of the bookkeeping world is insisted on and becomes forever the pointless torture it always was. You've been given a great gift of God's grace. Don't let this be head knowledge that just sits up here and says grace is great. Let this be heart knowledge that transforms you so that you walk from this place knowing you've been forgiven and are called to forgive others. Okay, I said this sermon was to you today. Now I want you to go back to those two or three people you thought of. Okay? Because transformation is not just about knowledge. It's about practice and reflection on that practice and doing it again. So, I would imagine pretty much everybody in this room today has some practice to do with transformation. Okay? Lord, today, we've heard a story of your grace and that transforming power in Tina's life. We've heard your invitation to live into that grace and reflect that in all that we do and not return ourselves to a hell where we are judging others. Lord, this is a tough truth and I don't know in a room like this what the stories are that brings tears to eyes. But I do know that you have given us a choice this day on the way that we are called to live. And I know that every one of us here, Lord, is longing to be people that reflect your grace. We don't do that in our own strength. We do that in the strength of the one who saves us, Jesus Christ. So let us move from here and practice that grace. In Jesus' name.